<laughs> Big sigh there. Yeah. <laughs> One of those days. We're both going to have problems with this. Hey, did, did we talk about, do you know people think we sound alike? Have you heard that from anybody? Yeah, you asked me that. I, yeah. I don't think we I, do. I, Yeah, I thought I did ask you that. I heard it again over the weekend. Oh, huh. Yeah, well, maybe so. I should talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know we're live. You know we're live now. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome everyone. Uh I want you all to wish a happy anniversary to Tim and Joan and Julia and Chris because we have two anniversaries uh being celebrated today. Oh, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. I can I can hear the applause from here. Yeah, yeah. I, thank I you. Him. Thank you. I, I hear him. So are you gonna are you gonna take Joan out to dinner tonight? Uh <laughs> he is now. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Are you taking Joan out to a nice expensive dinner? Oh, uh, keeps getting better every minute, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got some very special plans. Oh, you 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 could celebrate your win in the in the tie off today. Yeah, well, uh, we'll we'll see. This this is a tough one, and not my idea either. Why, why don't you come clean on who who uh, dreamed this little gem up? Well, it was mine, and you know we haven't we've tied. You and I have both tied steelhead flies before i mean i know you've tied egg flies on your channel and you've tied intruders but um we've never tied a classic actually not so classic but a, a spay fly a single hook um, spay fly and uh you know they're they're uh, quite popular and effective for both steelhead and atlantic salmon and they're also beautiful um and it's it uses some different techniques. Uh, the the I got the idea from. I actually put it in a book. There's the Skykomish dark. Uh, oh, yeah. So I've tied it before. Um, I had this. I have. I've had this book out um, for a few weeks. Uh, it was originally published by Rizzoli and. Um, Lions Press picked it up, but it's it's a dozen of the kind of the iconic American flies like the Lefty Deceiver and the Elk Hair Caddis and talks a lot about how the flies were developed, you know, where, mm -hmm. where they came from, how they were developed. Because people, I find, are interested in that, you know, where where did the mother minnow come from? Who invented it? Where did the woolly bugger come from? And so... And that, um, that's available now, though, Tom, the book? Yeah. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah. It's available now. It's called Essential uh, American Flies. Anyway, so it was in there, and I was flipping through there, and I thought, oh, let's tie a, let's tie a steelhead fly, but let's tie a spay version. So, um, mm -hmm. that's why I decided to do it. And that's... it does use some techniques that we for sure haven't done on, on our live tie off and i don't think i've done in any i don't think i've tied a spay fly in any of my things have you tied one no no and you know 600 odd tying videos and and uh not not a single spay um, yeah i've actually been kind of kind of saving it and reading and checking out older books and trying to get my techniques down and <laughs> <laughs> you kind of caught me by surprise because I'm not there yet, but <laughs> well, it's it's you know we're both of us are going to have to stretch a little bit because yeah, yeah. The which is always and, good, yeah, yeah. And where where this fly came from is there's a very uh, classic fly called the Skykomish Sunrise, which is a classic hair wing um, uh, fly. And how it came about was Ken McLeod was a, a you know a, a legendary. Uh, Northwest steelheader who actually worked a lot on um, the original shooting heads. And he worked on the first sinking lines with scientific anglers, the first real density, high density lines. And he didn't tie flies, but his son George did. And they were driving the river one day. And, and Ken said to his son, George, tie me a fly that, that, uh, that 
imitates the light over the sky comish at sunrise. So the original fly had orange and red and white in it. And this is this is a, a darker version, a spay. It's called the dark sky comish, uh, developed by a guy named Steve Gobin, who took the the colors of the original sky comish sunrise and oh, okay. darkened it and turned it into more of a spay fly. Yeah, I was seeing Gobin here and there in, in you know various things I was reading and. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know what it was. I, yeah, is, so, yeah. Is it a bait fish or is it is it a guy? Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's a guy. It's a guy. <laughs> so, anyways, that's that's how the fly came about. There are a lot of variations of the uh, skycomber sunrise. Trey Combs has a variation with a marabou wing, and um, you know the original fly had a, a, a your white calftail or bucktail wing. Wow, could I could I tie either one of them instead of a barred mallard? <laughs> no, we're tying we're tying a I, I, I guess you'd call it a tented mallard wing or a low yeah wing, a, a spay style spay style wing and you know the spay flies are uh, were originally developed in um, Scotland right Scotland yeah yeah river spay and uh, they have long flowing hackle. And, uh, you know, originally a lot of them were tied with hair and hackle, which is yeah. illegal, illegal to buy and sell. But uh, we're going to use uh, we're going to use a yellow schloppen feather, which is just a big webby chicken feather to imitate that. Yeah. And I, I'm actually going to use just webby saddle hackle. I didn't I, had, I have schloppen, but not in the right color. So okay, uh, just going to wing it. Use what you got, you know. And you should all know that both Tim and I are going to have trouble with this fly, and it's going to be a challenge for us. So uh, neither of us are looking forward to it. <laughs> well, and the, the other thing we should probably mention, Tom, I don't know about you, but um, for for me, th this one involves a lot of navigating around the camera that's between me and the fly. And, yeah. and so yeah. that... The, the camera kind of ups the uh, ups the ante a bit because it's it's very much a hands on fly that you got to do a lot of manipulation and and real real careful m manipulation as well. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. so if we bump the camera or you can't yeah. see something, bear with us. Uh, yeah, it's can't can't seeing it that worries me. I, I you guys just yell or scream or something and uh do you practice in front of the camera when you practice these flies i i did the last one uh just just to be sure and that that's why i'm saying it because the camera really became an obstacle um <laughs> but uh yeah yeah i do i i, I um I don't practice in front of the camera so i may have some surprise <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right, shall we? Shall we do it? This is going to be a long one. Yeah, yeah, we should get going. <clears throat> All right. Who, Who's are talking? you going to? Um, am I allowed to start, Jones? Is what, it, whatever you guys want. I think Tom started last time, didn't he? Yeah. You can anyway, I'll you start. start. Okay. All right. So, uh, first, let me um, get cameras turned on, and. I'm on camera. This is what the, hopefully the final result would look something like this. And with the barred mallard kind of tented uh, across the back, uh, that the hackles sweeping back, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, guys. Um, <laughs> may not look exactly like that. Anyway, mine starts with a uh, really cool, uh, really sexy looking uh, one and a half spay spay hook, an Alec Jackson spay hook. They they just, I mean the the bend, the curve. There, there's just everything about them is just gorgeous, uh, in my estimation. Uh oh. There you go. Thank you. So I'm gonna get the hook really well secured in, in my tying vise. It's a you know really long shanked hook, and, and you just want to make sure it's locked in there. Uh, kind of a, a weird thing that I do pretty much whenever I'm tying salmon flies. I just got in the habit of it. I use white thread to start, and this is this is Vivas eight aught, so fairly 
thin but strong and the, the reason is is if their their colors or anything like that bright colors that go over it they they tend to hold uh, their color a little better with uh, white underneath and I'm gonna get it started up on that that uh, hook eye return and just take wraps take a few wraps rearward snip that excess tag off what I'm really doing here is, is closing down the return just get that nice and tight on there and drop off the return. Leave that right there. I'm going to go. I'm going to keep on going, guys, until Tom tells me to stop. A uh, little tag, a tip, I guess you call it at the end, is medium oval tins, uh, tinsel silver. Just kind of, I'm going to use this later. So I'm going to cut a fairly long or, yeah, you know, cut a fairly long piece off of here and come back to it. Only going to take a few wraps with this and so i'm going to start it on the the hook shank right at the the eye return we're trying to fill in that space there kind of push it under what i found is if you take the material and just bring it to the far side of the hook like this just kind of hold it there when you take wraps it kind of plants it right on the underside of the hook is where i want it to start when i start wrapping so i just keep on wrapping rearward and I'm going to go pretty – go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Sorry. It's interesting that uh, sandwich fly tires always uh, tie all their stuff underneath the hook for the body as opposed to on top. Yeah. I, you know, so you can't see that juncture, I guess. I mean – Yeah, I guess. I'm yeah. relatively sure that a salmon isn't going to care, but um, I could yeah. be wrong. And I was instructed in the recipe from Mr. Rosenbauer only to take – two turns for mm. that tip you could take three or four because i'm taking four i'm using fairly oh, fine man okay so the other thing i'll, I'll, gi I'll give you permission thank you <laughs> to deviate from the the recipe yeah. now i'm going to snip this off i will use this other piece a little later but just to keep everything evened up i'm going to run this the the back end all the way back and again fill in that return the other thing that this does is is i found what i'm uh particularly spay casting the uh these little wraps back there tend to drift down and so and kind of unwind and you want the, those suckers really really well anchored um, yeah. to, to keep them from doing that so I, th I think the purpose of those is to keep the floss from uh, yeah, yeah. at the end of the fly. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to stop there if that's okay with you. Let you get started. Or okay. should I keep going? All right. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. take it over. All right. Super. So I'm going to use, actually. Oops, Tim, you lost the feed. Yeah. I'm going to use the same hook in a size three, a little bit smaller than Tim's because it's what I had. Um, the Alec Jackson hook, is a, again, it's, as Tim said, it's a beautiful salmon hook. It's got a beautiful curvature to it. And I'm going to secure it in my vise. How about that? Now I'm going to have to get a little closer because otherwise I'd be too far away from the, otherwise I'd be too far away from the, uh, the fly to get, get my hands in there. So yeah, the, the camera is getting in the way and I'm going to start the same as Tim to close that return and by the return tim means that piece of wire there because it's a looped eye so i i don't know if everybody followed that but it's it's a, a loop of wire that's not closed so you just want to close that when you start and then i am going to grab a long piece of 
Oval tinsel. Oval tinsel is hard to find. Not many people sell it anymore. You know, it's not used that much. This yeah, and, so, and some of it has a, a core that sticks out, which I really don't like. Yeah. So I don't know, yeah, I don't know whether you've noticed that. but. And I'm going to place that underneath. And just like Tim, bind it down. keeping it underneath just by pressing my index finger against there. And then when I get to the hook point, that's my measuring. That's where I start winding that tip. A couple more turns. All right, one more maybe. Okay, so it's even, threads even with the hook point. And then I'm going to take my first turn on the bare shank and then come up and push that against the other turn so that the you know the turns are against each other so i'm going to take three turns and then i'm going to tie this off underneath with two turns only tight turns and i'm going to leave that there because i'm going to rib with oval and i don't see the need to I don't see the need to uh, tie another piece on. So I'm going to just leave it there. I can see right. I got to fix something here. I couldn't see it until I looked at the camera there. Okay. I kind of wound back over on my tip there. All right. Should I do uh Yeah, well, why don't I you go ahead, Tom? Okay. So I got my tip in. I got my tip in there, and um, the next thing that I am going to do is I'm going to prepare my hackle. Now, Tim, Tim only um, winds his hackle over the uh, the uh, fur part, the front third of the body. I'm going to I'm going to uh, hackle the whole. I'm going to hackle the whole fly. It's just a matter of style. So I'm going to take my schloppen feathers, yellow, and I'm going to look for a nice kind of straight, not bunged up uh, piece of tackle. That looks pretty good there. And I want the stuff to be, you know, a little longer than the hook gate. Let me move this stuff out of the way. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to strip this junk off the bottom, this webby stuff. I'm not going to use it. Get it out of the way. All that web just needs to go away. And then I am going to stroke this hackle back. And I want... The fibers that are webby, I don't want these. I don't want these these fibers tied in because they're not gonna they're not gonna lay back where I want. It. So I'm gonna stroke it until I find the hackle that's uh, folding back, and that's the hackle I'm gonna use from here from here down. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hold that. I'm going to cut the tip off. I'm going to cut the fibers along the side so that I have something, little nubs. And then I'm going to strip one side of this because I don't, I, I don't want a real, I don't want a real, um, I don't want a real dense hackle for this spay hackle. So when I when I tie this in by this tip and wind it, I want the stuff on this side because this is the stuff that's gonna that's gonna lay back. So I'm gonna strip 
everything off the other side of the hackle carefully. So that leaves me with a hackle with stuff only on one side. I'm going to go back and since this is the last thing I'm going to wind through the body, it's the first thing I'm going to tie in. And I'm just going to this in this case I'm going to tie this in on top. Tie it in carefully. Top side doesn't really matter, but just to make sure it's really secure because if that pulls out after I've wound my whole body, I'm going to be in big trouble. So I think, and you can see when I wind this, it's going to fold back properly. I think I'll, I think I'll stop there, Tim. All right. Oh boy. We're, we're going down different paths already. Um, Good. I, I kind of <laughs> wish now that I took your path, but uh, <laughs> kind of committed to it. Uh, let me just check to make sure on this camera. The only no, we're... true path, my son. <laughs> <laughs> Should have seen that one coming. Um, let me get locked in here again. All right, uh, back to it. So I, I'm going to tie in floss. I do. I leave a, a little bit, about the quarter of a shank length of orange floss, just showing, um, kind of out there, all on its own. No, oh, no, uh, no, no hackle over top of it. I saw that in one, one of the pattern books I was looking at. <clears throat> and again, I'm I'm kind of doing it to fill in the return there, and so same deal and you know I, i'm not really making touching wraps of tying thread it's it's not really that critical and um this is probably the only part of the the body that really really has to be smooth is this little bit of uh floss back here and i think it's supposed to cover about a quarter I kind of mark it with my tying thread about a quarter of the shank and so just to build up a little bit of bulk but still keep it smooth slightly overlapping and hopefully I won't tear this floss apart I usually do yeah it's tough it's yeah. tough. You get get those little strands that tend to. Yeah, and and I just got back from three days fishing on the Salmon River. My hands are a little, little torn up. How was the Salmon River? Uh it was good. Um, actually, very nice. I I uh, I did not land one this time. Not not I uh, had a lot of uh, ones that were. I believe we're fouled anyway and broke them off. Lost a nice brown, which was real bummer. That one broke off. Saw a, a few steelhead, not too many, but uh, they're starting. Cool. But, it, I mean, it's amazing. I, I think it was in the 70s most of the days or high 60s anyway and i've been up there this time of year when it's snowing and sleeting and just miserable yeah nasty um so there is um there's that orange little band back there should i keep keep on going that way i, can, I think i can catch up to you a little bit maybe okay yeah um or no you know what go ahead tom um, I, yeah, I think it'll even out. So why don't you go? Okay. All right. So I am going to next take a piece of, uh, Mylar tinsel and Mylar tinsel is gold on one side and, um, silver on the other. If you see any old, sometimes you'll see older tinsel that was actually silver and gold. I don't know if it was plated or what, but it was, it was actual metal and it would tarnish. It was a pain in the butt to use. 
uh, this mylar tinsel is really nice because it's gold on one side and silver on the other. So you only have to buy one spool. Um, and this is a medium, uh, medium tinsel. So I am going to tie this on underneath and I am going to have my, my gold against the hook so that when I start wrapping this, the silver flips over. So I'm going to attach this silver tinsel underneath the body all the way back. You have to make sure that when you start it, aha, uh -huh, it goes the right way, which it didn't because I twisted it a little bit there. So I'm going to start over. See, I start with the gold side out, so it flips over to the silver, but that could just yeah. be me. Well, maybe I'll try that. Yeah. Maybe I'll try that. I'll try a flagler trick here. <laughs> is that gold side out or? It's gold. I don't know what it is. Uh, okay. see it. It's still flipping over. There we go. Okay. It'll work. I can make it work. <laughs> uh, should I tie in my floss now? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So I'm going to come up and I make my floss uh, about a third of the shank. I don't, I don't know if that makes a difference. Again, this is, uh, these are just, style points that you can make your fly any way you want. There's not a real standard pattern, I don't think. And this is a three strand floss. You can tell it's pretty old. It's got a wooden spool. And I'm just going to pull a few inches of it. Yeah, what a mess. Yeah, that's the stuff I, I can't even use it, Tom. My, my hands just tear it apart. Yeah. And I, I wet it so that the strands stay together. I wet the end of it anyways. And then I'm going to tie and get that tinsel stuff out of the way. I'm going to tie this in. I'm going to try to get it underneath if I can, just because it's sort of, it's sort of a salmon fly. Although it's a steelhead fly, it's tied like a salmon fly and then smooth out any, you know, with my tying thread, smooth out any stuff that doesn't look right. And then carefully, Cover up. Just same as Tim, slightly over wrapping. You want to be careful not to slide the floss through your fingers too much, because that will cause those little those little filaments of floss to uh, slip out and then I'll take a couple turns to tie it off I will cut that and then just to make sure it's secure I'll wind it forward just I could be neater about this but uh, it's going to be all covered up by fur so it doesn't matter and then come back and wait. And wait for Tim. <laughs> yeah, that uh, fortunately that uh, seal fur that goes on can cover up a multitude of sins. That's that's yes. uh, I kind of one of one of my secrets to the pattern. Um, yeah, is, uh, it's nice to have that. Uh, so there we are. There, we just get refocused. 
All right, uh, kind of kind of the same as Tom just did. I, I'm going to start off um, with what kind of reverse order of how things are going to be tied. Um, this is a, again that same uh, medium silver oval tinsel, so I'm going to get that tied in first. And this is the length that I had from before. Try to get it under on the underside of the hook a little bit. Come on, Tim. Give it a little tug there. We go. And just wrap that so it stays on the other side of the hook all the way back to the orange. And then I'm going to go forward. I, I you can wrap both the, the tinsel and the, um, the, the mylar, the flat mylar in at the same time. If you want, I just actually found it easier to, to do them separate. I'm not yeah, so worried that's, about that's the hard way to try to do them together together. Yeah. And, and, uh, I'm not really worried about thread bulk. This this um, this eight aught thread is is super super thin and and strong. But I am going to take it and just gold side out for me. And again, I'm going to try to keep it sort of under. And. Even though you see it up here, thread torque as I'm as I'm going back here is gonna push it to the underside. About like that. Better flip it to make sure it's gonna be silver. I don't wanna do that yet. You're making me <laughs> nervous, Tom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not not that I'm not that I'm not trying that you're trying to. to? <laughs> All right, and next I'm going to go, I, and uh, this is where I'm kind of having some regrets, but I'm, I'm committed to it. I, I don't, I didn't have yellow schlappen, and so I'm going to use uh, just very webby. It, it almost looks like schlappen. Um, yeah, that, that's, really a pe that's really a piece of schlappen. It might have been in a bag of saddle hackles, but that's yeah, what yeah. I call schlappen. Yeah, schlappen. nice and webby. Is it schlappen or schlappen? Or schlappen. Yeah, which, which is the preferred pronunciation? We got to get. I don't this know. Right. People will correct us, you know. People will will correct us if we're wrong. <laughs> I am so sure of that. Um, so shiny sides facing me. My tie-in is a little different, and you know, I, I got to cover um, you know quite a few turns with this stuff, and I I don't want to be short on it. And like Tom said, about a hook gap and a half for, for these fibers. And I do like them a little longer up front. But uh, this this is probably just going to make a lot of people cringe. But I just snipped that off. I'm not really making a tie-in anchor. But what I found is if, if I tie in just like this and wrap right, right there, that that produces a really, really strong connection. And mm. because with with this one, um, you know, Tom stripped one side, I'm gonna actually fold this and b b before I wrap it. And and so I wanna make sure that that is absolutely in there. I'm, I'm gonna wait and uh, fold it just a little bit later. I'm gonna leave my tying thread right right about there. And uh, back to you, Mr. Rosenbauer. Oh, it's my turn already? It is. Back to you. Okay. Well, I don't like... Uh, I don't like dubbing loops, but I think that for this material, we need a dubbing loop. Oh, you sure do. Uh, I tried dubbing it on, and this stuff is wiry and i just wanted to show people um i want to show people on camera um i have this uh, flies like this originally called for baby seal under fur and um anybody that knows 
that label will know that that company's been out of business for about 45, 50 years. Um, seal fur is, is illegal to, to, I think, to sell. Um, but anyway, um, this is what used to be used on, uh, this is seal fur. And you can see it's very glassy, maybe hard, hard to see there, but it's very kind of, kind of glassy and flashy. Um, but we have stuff around these days that is so much better than seal like this uh, Jorgensen's blend or SLF dubbing blend. These are synthetics and they have even more sparkle uh, than, than baby seal. So don't worry if you don't have seal to tie these classic flies because um, the stuff we have around now is actually better. So I'm not gonna use, not gonna use that seal, but just, you know, if you've never seen it, that's what seal fur looks like. And Angora goat, and uh, a lot of these synthetics uh, do a wonderful job and they have a really nice sparkle to them. And they come in, you know, great colors too. So I'm gonna make my loop. And fairly long loop. You can't see it. Maybe I can put the other camera on here. I'm going to attach my dubbing weight, my dubbing spinner to there. Let me put the other camera on there if I can. Yeah, probably see that a little bit better that way. So I've got my loop here on my spinner which i see is is only uh on one leg of my spinner and i always do this backwards and then i'm going to wax my loop with some relatively sticky wax just to hold help hold the stuff on there Oh, you know, I saw a great trick that I was going to do today, Tim, from, I think it was from, uh, it was in Fly Tire Magazine. I think it might have been Al Ritt. Um, you know how you, you know how you always get dubbing wax and it gets clumpy by the end of the tube? Yep. He puts it on a post-it note, smears it on a post-it note, and then uses the post-it to, uh, apply the dubbing wax, which I think is a really great idea. I will give that a try. Yeah, you're the post-it man. You were always using yeah. post-it. So anyway, now I'm gonna advance my thread up to the, about to the return. I'm gonna open up my loop and, oh, the first thing I'm gonna do is kind of taper, I got too much dubbing there, taper this this bunch of dubbing so that it's a little bit skinnier and then it gets a little thicker and I'm going to try to try to taper it before I stick it in the loop and then open the loop up with my finger, trap it in there and then spin it. And you'll probably have too much, so you may, you may have to, you know, pull a little bit out of there. Can I, yeah, you can see that okay. I think I'll go to the other camera now. And now I'm going to just wrap that noodle right up against the floss. I don't want that red thread to show through there. And, oh boy, that's too much. I gotta take some of that off. That's way too much. And give it another spin. That's way too thick. But luckily, when you make a dubbing noodle like this, you can, you can re-spin it, retwist it. That's a little bit better. 
You want this to be fairly bulky so that it shows through. And I think I'll end right about there. Yeah, I'll end and I'll tie this, I'll tie this uh, down underneath the shank. About three really tight turns. And then I will trim it out of the way and give it a couple more, a few more turns for security. So there is my dubbing loop. Back to you, I, Tim. I guess I'm up. Um, kind of the same idea for me, guys. Sorta. I, I, uh, I, boy, if I had some of that SLF, I definitely would have used it. Um, I'm gonna go with Angora and uh, simply it's a seal substitute. Uh, if you've ever tried uh, dubbing with Angora, it's it's not fun stuff. It, it's very, uh, very slippery, and uh, just doesn't. I'll show you in a second here because I am going to try try to dub it on my tying thread. I'm zoomed all the way out. Hopefully, you can see this whole procedure. Anyway, I'm going to grab a little sticky dubbing wax. I, I don't do a loop. Um, some of you guys have seen my tying videos. May have seen me do this same technique before. Just it's a little different. I'll I'll admit to that. But yeah, it does not. This stuff just does not want to go on the tying thread at all. Even I, and I rarely use dubbing wax um, when I when I'm putting dubbing on. And I'm going to make a very long, uh, fairly thick dubbing noodle, and just compress it down a whole lot uh, by spinning it up, and just try to fill in some of those open spots. So yeah, this is like, you know, rather than. Um, split thread or a dubbing loop. I'm I'm really just trying to my best to to make a cohesive noodle on this thread, uh, and this stuff just does not like to cooperate. And if I even touch this, all all that dubbing could conceivably come off. But kind of the touch it, the, touch it. <laughs> <laughs> the really critical thing here is when you take wraps, just make sure that that there's dubbing on up right, right up there around the shank. And then what I do is bring my tying thread up kind of back where I started wrap backwards and snip my tying thread there. So it's, it's kind of like a, a, a dubbing loop, but sort of not really. And the other important thing here is I'm going to use plunger style hackle pliers. I'm not going to grab down the thread. I'm going to grab up here and I'm going to take a loop through those pliers. So both the thread and the dubbing can't come undone. Uh, dubbing whirl is going to be a little hard for you guys to see, but I'm just going to spin this up with the dubbing whirl. Get out of there, you. And you can see it really, really cords up. And so I'm kind of left with almost just fuzzy thread in the end. Don't want to take it too far. And just going to wrap rearward. Just make sure that there's no white. Do you want to zoom in now, Tim? Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Sorry guys, this is a little little hard to hang on to and one handed. Yeah. Get focused. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that there's no white thread peeking through there. And then I'm gonna take touching wraps. I may even th this stuff gets down so thin, I may even have to do a second one to get the coverage that I want. Yeah, I can tell that I am going to have to add another. So I'll just come back here, get another wrap around there. Mm. I know it's a little time consuming guys, but to me, it just makes for a nice, really tight little body on the fly. 
real quick that repeat. Should, this should probably be points off having to. Do you think so? Off. Having to put yeah. a second. Yeah, okay. I think I think that should be points off. And, and, and your glue, your stuff, your stuffy. And uh, you mean pulling this stuff off when you dub too much didn't come off, or they aren't points off? No, because it was still the same piece. That's my oh, rule. Okay. That's my okay. rule. I just, I just invented it. He just made that one up, did you? So I just did that. Joan just reminded me I didn't put dubbing wax down, so holy cow. I should get ex extra pro points for that. Dubbing Angora with no dubbing wax. Again, I'm going to get that dubbing. Make, just make sure it started full loop. Come back. Hey, get back there, you. And hopefully this should be enough to, uh, to finish off. Sorry, guys, for the delay. I apologize. No third, no third dubbing, Luke. No, we, we won't do a that third. Would definitely be, that would we'll definitely make, be. Yeah. We'll make this one last. <laughs> <laughs> I just won't twist it as much. That's the kind of the cool thing about doing it this way. It, it is as much as you want to twist it, um, you can. And you can see it's a little fluffier there. Yeah, it looks like uh, that's a great technique. I like yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things, whether it's a dubbing loop or one of these, if if you have too much, it it's not so critical. You because you just take your thread and you know yeah get get rid of yeah. yeah get rid of the end of it and so that's the red red little fluffy body on mine. And I yeah I'm I'm a little ways I, I like to. You guys probably remember from tying the Undertaker when we Tom and I tied the Undertakers. I like to keep a, a little ways back from the eye, just a little turtle knot space, just a stylistic thing. But mm, yeah, all you Tom. Okay, all right. So now we're gonna wind lots of stuff. The first thing we're gonna wind is the uh, silver tinsel, if it ends up being silver. there and you know traditionally five turns so i've got to try to space this one two three four five and tie it on tie it down underneath If you want to take six or four, that's perfectly okay. But you know, on Atlantic salmon flies, when I was learning how to tie full dress flies, I was told that it was five turns. So I make five turns. Now the next thing is to take that oval tinsel and follow along just behind the silver. So you're going to butt it right up against, you can actually push it into there. And that helps support the uh, silver tinsel. And it also gives you something to wrap that hackle up against. And so. You, you think that would add a little protection for the hackle stem, Tom, having it right next I to the I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, th I yeah. think it does, Tim. I don't, I, I'm not exactly sure why it's done that way, but yeah, I think it probably, it probably does. And then I'm going to wind my hackle. And I'll probably use hackle pliers. This is kind of short. And I am going to fold that. But I don't need to. I don't need to worry too much because it's going to kind of naturally fold in place because it's only coming off one side. And you sometimes have to twist the hackle back into position. But if you follow that oval tinsel, 
it will fold back nicely for you. And the oval tinsel will for, kind of force it back so you get that kind of streaming spay style hackle. And then I like to take a couple of extra turns in front just to give it a little more hackle up towards the front. But now you've got that nice flowing, flowing hackle that uh, gives you a lot of action in the water. Boy, it is hard to get in here, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and that's where the heron really, the heron just looks yeah. beautiful, oh but. God. Yeah. And then I'm gonna just take a couple of turns here just to make sure I got that hackle secured. So, you know, it all flows back kind of nicely. Okay. Oh boy. See now this is the part I'm regretting. I, I, I like I said, I went down a different road than you did. And um, but I'm kind of committed to it, I guess. Oops. So I I chose to leave my um hackle intact. Um, but you know, both sides, but we'll get to that in a second. I'm gonna also grab get hold of that that um which way did we go here come on get out of there you so got hold of that silver tinsel i i too i'm gonna try to do five And that looks like five to me. Anchor that on the underside. And I really went back and forth on this as to which, whether I wanted to put the, um, the oval tinsel in back or in front. And like Tom, I, I decided to put it in back it kind of just made sort of logical sense for me it, it wants to slip off that slip off that um, flat tinsel and kind of rest against the dubbing a little bit All right, now the not so fun part for me. Um, I need to fold this this hackle back, and one of the ways it just takes takes a little teasing. Um, uh, they're they're guys that that fold their hackle prior to tie in, and it in I, I don't know how many times I've tried it. It's got to be in the hundreds, and I just simply can't do it uh, if it's not tied in. I, I it's just a technique. It's always bugged me that I can't do it. I tried it a couple of times yesterday. Uh, still never got it. And uh, maybe one of you guys has some secret to doing that. But Do you ever so, try uh, slipping it through a foam block? You know, or like, no. Uh, there, you know, you make a slit in like a magic eraser or something like that. And okay. you, you put the hackle in there and you kind of pre-fold it and then you run it through that slit in a you know rubber or foam or whatever okay and uh it kind of folds it yeah it doesn't work that well for me but you might try <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, 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 that that hand folding is just it it's been a mystery to me since i i started tying yeah So still, still fairly sparse, um, swept back and, uh, but you, you know, you gotta, you gotta get it folded and, and that can be problematic sometimes. 
Um, but the, oh, my ribs a little off. Um, but it also, you get the red, you get this, you know, the two different kinds of silver. So I think that's okay. That's yeah. And that's, I'm going to stop right there, right at the front edge of that yellow hackle. All righty. You're up. Okay. So. Hope Tim gets you there's a front hackle on here, and it is from a, uh, the pattern calls for uh, ringneck pheasant body feathers dyed black, which is what this is, because it's kind of, it has those long sweeping fibers, um, kind of looks like heron. Um, you can also use a webby black hackle if you don't have pheasant body feathers. But they use these pheasant body body feathers a lot on um, on steelhead flies and salmon flies. So I'm just going to strip the fuzz at the bottom and then pull this back, stroke it back. And this I am going to fold. Stroke it back like that. And give myself cut myself a little nib at the bay, at the front of it. And tie that in. This you can tie in at the top. Go all the way back to the body. Make sure you got it in there securely. Trim your uh, trim your tip off. If there's any broken fibers, trim them off. Let me raise this up a little bit. Oh, I actually back up a little bit here. And then I'm going to just fold this hackle back. You can wet it a little bit too. And just kind of work it. And after each turn, you want to refold. And about three turns of that stuff, you know, it's fairly sparse, this front, this front hackle. Maybe I'll go four. Should I go four? Yeah, I'll go four. But you can see that that, that pheasant um, gives it a nice flowing look. And then tie that down. Cut it off. And then to make sure it's secure, just stroke all this stuff back and go back over it right up over almost to the body and now that sweeps back nicely show it to you there okay tim all righty. Uh, where am I? <laughs> oh, I I did not have any of the the black uh, pheasant rump or yeah, uh, but I do have. I, again, this is just it. It's supposed to be saddle hackle, but boy, is it ever webby! And uh, I want these fibers to be just just about the same as those front fibers there I, I don't really need too many of them and i am going to use the same kind of tie-in technique that i did and you know what i will do it like that so i'm just going to hold on to that and by going over all the fibers like that. Can I get a little closer? 
Yeah. Uh. So let me, I'll show you what I mean again because they're closer. By going all, over all those fibers and the stem, it makes folding it a little more difficult, but it makes for a, a very uh, positive like it shouldn't pull out. Now watch it pull out. Um, but where did my hackle pliers go? You want to borrow mine? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Email them to me, would you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to get hold of the hackle stem up here and just do my best, kind of bend the stem down through my fingers and get that some of that. I don't, I really don't want too much going around here. Stay up there, you. I got a few trapped there, but I think that's okay. You can fix it in post. Fix it in post. Yeah, boy, that's another wrap that's tough around the camera. Holy goodness. Yeah. And then I'm just going to come back and kind of pin those fibers back, clean things up a little bit there. Um, they're still nice and fluffy. There we go. And I am going to just um, change my thread out here, guys. This is get rid of that white thread and switch over to the red uh, that we'll be using for the head. So just a real quick whip finish. Don't want to build up too much bulk there, but nice thin thread. And they're looking pretty good. Everything's spread around nice. And fairly sparse, which I, I really think is, is kind of key with these guys, is just to keep it not not too dense. All righty, Tom. Here we go. Here the we part, go. The part we're hating. Yeah. Okay, so this fly uses, and I think I'll make my background white here. This fly uses, uh, if I can find them, bronze mallard wings, and they're folded tent shape. Uh, oops. They're folded tent shape over the body. And um, bronze mallard is. Uh, there's only, I don't know, four or five feathers on each duck wing. Um, it's a, a drake mallard, a mature drake mallard. There aren't many, uh, so it's, it's a difficult material to obtain. But if you're a duck hunter, um, you, can, you can get bronze mallard, or you can buy it. Uh, it tackle shops do sell it, but it's not, not easy to find. And you need a matched right and left. So you can see these have a opposing curvature. And... You know, they're about the same size. Really tough to get them exactly matched. But you need rights and lefts, and you need to um, need to get rid of any fibers, uh, fuzzy fibers along the bottom. And what we're going to do is cut a slip from, from each one of these. Now, the key to working with bronze mallard is to leave the stem attached. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this like so, and I'm going to look at it next to my fly. I'm just going to hold it over there. And that's not quite enough, so I'm going to, I'm going to reattach that by stroking it. The feathers have a little zipper, little zipper. And you could, you could probably use a caliper or something to exactly measure these, but... Um, 
That's about right. So what, what I'm going to do, that's the wing width I want. I'm going to come in and snip the stem right there. And I'll get rid of the stuff on the other side and cut that shorter. Mm -hmm. So I've got, I've got that, that piece. And the beauty here is it sometimes takes several tries to get these wings right. And if you keep them attached to the stem, as I have there, uh, you, can, you can have a do-over without losing, without losing all your uh, mallard without it, you know, falling apart, because you can stroke it back together. I assume you've been doing that, Tim. Nope. Oh, <laughs> that's why you're having so much trouble. Yep. But that, that, that Tom, is, that is a seriously cool technique. I've seen people do it with turkey, where they, you know, have both sides when you, you have a turkey that's even yeah. on either side, and they snip yeah. it. But that, that makes total sense for doing this. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to keep adding some fibers on there until I get them matched better. And now that's yeah, that's good. Let me see. I'm going to hold it up on my fly. Yeah, that's good. So now I'm going to I'm going to separate this snip it right there. Get rid of that one. Snip it. Get rid of that stuff on the other side just because it'll get in the way and now i've got my wings and i can re you know i can redo those i can i can keep working with them if if something's wrong and they're not going to fall apart gotcha should i make should I, should I put the wings on now yeah go ahead we're, we're running late okay so you you want the uh you want the the wing to slope down like so. So this is going to be your far wing, okay? So that it slopes down along the body. So this is tricky, and there are a number of ways to do this. And the way I've found it easiest is to just lay this kind of on the top, and the wing should be about the length of the body, and you have to very, very carefully bring the thread over on that so that it doesn't fold the wing with a very loose turn and then tweak it down on there a little bit and look at it from the far side and that doesn't look so good. So because I kept that attached to the stem, I can try it again. I'm going to try it again. And nope, that's no good. <laughs> I'm going to try it again. Maybe I'll... That looks like it might have done it. Yeah, that's good enough. That's going to be, that's going to have to be good enough. So I've got the far wing on there. Now I'm going to take my other one. And the trick for this one is you want it to roll into the other wing so that it's all one roof shaped piece. But so you measure it and then you tie it in. You tie it in so it's sticking up like so. And then you just kind of tweak it down into position so that it rolls into that other side. Like so. And now, once you've got those, once you've got that roof, that roof, that mallard roof on top of there, hopefully it won't come apart. Then you can take a couple of really tight turns to secure them. 
like so. And very carefully come in and trim away the butts. Now you notice that I'm crowding my eye quite a bit more than Tim. Um, it's just a style thing. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna have any junk in my eye, but I am. My, I'm just setting my wing uh, a lot closer to the eye. And sorry about the camera here. It's. Uh, I'm trying to get these fibers out of here, and I can't get them out. My thread will get rid of some of those. I'm going to get another pair of scissors, a real fine pair. How many pairs of scissors do you have, Tim? Five. <laughs> Six. Yeah. You can't have... And they're all they're all all very different. Yeah, you can't have too many pairs of scissors. And I'm gonna hope that I can pull that. Yeah, I'll pull that down. And there, the wing is set. Oops. It's not the greatest wing in the world, but it's low and they come together. So I'm happy with it. Should I whip finish and yes, I, I'm getting a message from the control room. Hang on, Tom. Apparently we're out of time. Uh, and we're going to have to call it a draw. <laughs> Good try. <laughs> <laughs> You're a big chicken. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Whip finish. I didn't see that little thing until I looked at it in the camera. And we won't, we won't, since we're running late, we won't, uh, we won't put head cement on these, but obviously you want a nice glossy head with, uh, I like UV cure epoxy on this. So do I. I don't like that wing at all. I don't like that wing at all. That's a terrible wing. Oh, well. Yeah, uh, just wait and see, Tom. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm up. Well, I, I did. Gosh, I don't even know whether this, this is proper or not. Um, uh, for speed's sake, most of the time what I'm going to do is I, I have a real fine uh, tweezers. And I'll go in and just break off. Um, no, it would be a good idea to start my tying thread before I start breaking stuff, huh? Um, mm -hmm. Starting my red thread. Sorry. Hopefully I didn't undo that hackle stem of the process. Anyway, what I was saying is I normally go in and just take these tweezers and break off anything that is bad. But we're just going to get all those back under control. And all I'm going to do is take my scissors and just cut down the middle here. Okay, nice and close, just down the top. And the, and the reason for this is it's kind of a different style, I guess, than Tom's, is I really like, if I can, to get that, that mallard flank just tented right on top really really down on the hook shank and did you think that was more a, a low water version tom is that what you said with it way down like that no, no just a different style or mine should be lower it just i didn't i didn't i didn't get it quite right okay so i'm gonna i also and this is i'm, I'm sure this is sacrilege but one of the things in messing around with this that I found 
is that just a little bit of dubbing um, placed right there it builds it up enough that it's more of a foundation for those feathers. And so it's probably cheating, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Nothing it's kind of a, a, yeah, a universal thing for me. If you're having trouble with any any tying technique, just lay down a little dubbing. Um, and, you know, not a lot. And it, I don't know, for whatever reason, it just seems to help things sit better, if you will. Just kind of a little almost head shaped thing, and I end with my tying thread right there. Hmm. Now, I, I love Tom's idea with leaving the stem in place, that it really just makes a ton of sense. Um, I have you can see a uh, couple of different ones. If, if I'm if I get a package of these, I, I break them out, clean them up, and then just thread wrap them together, and so I have them together. Uh, to use, but uh, plunger style hackle pliers in a pinch will do uh, just to hold them temporarily. So these these are um, you know matching feathers. But what I do to get even slips, again, I like Tom's idea better. But I'm going to go like this so the like sides are together, and just kind of estimate. snip into the stem and then pull those off and they're generally you need to tease that one back together generally about the same width okay now uh unlike tom i this is kind of a one-shot deal for me <sighs> they're nervous <laughs> Really, really nervous here. <laughs> this and, this live tying stuff is difficult. Oh, this isn't it? this is terrible. <laughs> really don't like it. <laughs> Are you doing the same as me? See, but I I really want it down the sides more. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm gonna go and that's what's preventing it from going down the side. So I'm going to snip off there. I know that one's going to do it on the near side. Again, I'm probably breaking every spay law in the book right now. Want it to come to Tra the back. Travis says we are too hard on ourselves. Oh, that, that one's feeling good. pretty good. That looks good. That looks good too. And then, ah, oh, this one kind of got a little raggedy. I'm going to go and same thing, just kind of tent it on that side. Say a little prayer. Oh, good. Yeah, Fine. that one's yeah, okay. Good. You know, some people um, will tie these in uh, together. Well, they'll just lay one on top of the other and just, Tie them in as a rule. Yeah, I, I was saying to you earlier, Tom, I've seen Davey McPhail do it on video, and he ties in double, like two layers, and all four uh, of them at the same time. I'm like, you got to uh, be kidding me. Yeah. And same thing, just get as many... And like Davy McPhail, I am going to go and use some magic wax on me tying thread. Is that your vineyards? This is my vineyards. Super sticky. And most of the time, it allows you to actually go up that ramp. Uh, you know what I mean? And most times, it'll go clunk, clunk and slip off. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that wax can be absolutely key. Hopefully, I didn't mess up my wing. That's not too bad. And I'm not going to fuss with it anymore. Kind of take the money and run, if you will. 
or maybe not. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to fuss with it, and I did. Do the whip finish, Tim. Oh, my God. This is the longest tying session ever. It is. But th this is the hardest fly we've done, Tom. I think yeah. like a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, the wings just is down more kind of tented on the top and yeah, down more on the back um, than Tom's. Just a different style, really, or a different look, I guess you'd say. And I do like to have just a little bit of room there for the for a curl knot or whatever. Nice glossy head and she's done. Oh wow. You glad that's over? I am so glad that's over. I, I really could care less about the results. <laughs> I, I know you guys don't want to hear that, okay. but zoom in, Tim. Um uh oh. We're splitting screen though, so we can't be too zoomed yeah. in. Do the reveal. Uh, hold on one second. I'm going to just bump up exposure just a little bit. Oh, my, my wing came apart. There it goes. I'm not going to touch mine. I'm scared to death to even breathe on that thing. Um, Tom, they're pretty, pretty close. Yeah. A little dip for different, but mm -hmm. it's a pretty fly, though. It is. Um, and there's lots but, of challenging stuff to. Yeah, but I mean, between the iron that's in it, the materials, and the time, it, it's not a two dollar fly. Mm -mm. No. I think it might focus a little better. They do look very similar, don't they? Yeah. If anyone's looking to vote, they can hop over to the Facebook Orvis Fly Fishing page. That's where we have the poll. Um, we'll give it about another minute. Good luck. Is it like 11.30, Julia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy anniversary, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Can I put some head cement on mine, Tom, before it gets away? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I want to lock the results in place. Um, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put some UV cure on mine. Yeah, I wish I could, but no go. All right, folks. We have a winner. And it is. With 63% of the votes. Close. Yay, wow. Tim. Oh, thank you guys. That's thank you. <laughs> oh. That was an anniversary gift. Yeah, I think that was a yeah. gift. <laughs> Lucky uh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Oh my goodness. Tim. Well, you you too, Tom. That that um, yeah that that was a tough one. I'm glad we did it though. <laughs> I, I think that's a good suggestion yeah. and, and uh, to stretch things every now and again. And uh, yeah, yeah. So it's my choice next time. It's your choice. Yeah, I'm thinking like maybe a green weenie or a zebra midge. How about Some, a glow bug? <laughs> a glow bug <laughs> could do that. Um, yeah, or, um, some, San Juan worms. San Juan yeah, worms. there you go. Something nice and easy. All right. We probably shouldn't keep these good folks too long. Yeah. Um, that yeah. was a long well, session, but thank you guys. Appreciate thank it. You. For thank you. Thank everyone for hanging in there. Uh, I noticed that people didn't drop off even as we got past the hour. So we appreciate you, all your questions and comments and, and uh, critiques. Uh, so we will see you, Tim and I will see you in a month, and I'll see you on Monday. I don't know what I'm tying. I think I'm tying a surf candy. 
on Monday. Am I trying to I, surf candy next Monday, Julia? I think I saw that on Facebook. So, yeah, surf candy. Yeah, so we'll be using lots of epoxy. I know people will be happy about that. <laughs> yeah, surf candy on Monday. <laughs> okay, surf candy. Bob Popovic surf candy on Monday. Great. Well done, gentlemen. Congratulations, Tim. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon. Oh, don't forget, uh, don't forget uh, this Thursday, there is a, um, there is a uh, live event, Fall Nymphing, with uh, Tim Doughton and Ethan Law, Thursday at 8 p.m., um, presented by uh, Orvis Retail Stores, Orvis Days. So tune in if you're if you want some basic nymphing tips, um, tune in on Thursday at 8 p.m. on the Orvis, uh, Orvis Learning Center and on uh, YouTube.